out. Okay, it's time for another lecture series here. This is lecture number seven. And this lecture is going to cover what is called the Era of Good Feelings. The Era of Good Feelings is going to take place from the War of 1812 until about, nine, about 18 to about 18 of 25 time period. And uh, I want to talk about a little things that happened here that kind of changed American history. In the era of good feelings, you're starting to see the rise toward a modern America. Uh, the country has changed immensely from the War of 1812, and we realized for the first time that we're here to stay. For the first time, the American people are no longer worried about anybody trying to invade them, anybody trying to stop our democracy. And the people of America celebrated here because of this. So the War of 1812 is a real catalyst here in this time period for the American people. Okay, it starts off first, guys, because we won, because we ended the War of 1812. Nobody won this war, nobody lost this war. This war was totally useless. This is the only thing that James Madison is known for is the War of 1812. And so is that war of no gain of any kind. It just cost us lots of money and it cost us the destruction of Washington, D.C. So Mr. Madison is only known for the War of 1812. Now, the Treaty of Ghent, Belgium, and the fall of, of 18, 1814 time period, you're going to see the Americans and the British come together and form a partnership. We are no longer enemies. We're no longer trying to regain one side or the other. We are totally a separate unit during this time period. Whatever the British decide to do in world affairs, we will work with them. And this policy has been going on into the present time period. So England and America have forged a friendship here after the War of 1812. The American people got extremely patriotic when this war came to an end. They flew the American flags. They celebrated their American heritage. They had big, they had big huge July the 4th parties around the country, fireworks the whole nine yards, and the American people celebrated their freedom here. We finally realized that we are now a grown-up country. We're no longer a little country trying to get started. We're now an adult country. In other words, we put on our long pants during this time period of this war. And so the American people celebrate because this war has come to an end. The Europeans celebrated in 1815. Napoleon was defeated. He had his Waterloo out here in Belgium. And Napoleon is arrested and sent off to the island of Elba in exile. Napoleon is gone. This war has come to an end. All right, this long 15-year war in Europe has come to an end. That long 25-year war in, in France has come to an end. And so you see a whole, new, a whole new experiment here going on in Europe once Napoleon has been defeated. So the American people are really looking forward to a new future, a future of major change to take place here in this time period. Well, a lot of change did take place. Between 1815 and 1819, we had four new states join the Union. These states made up the old Indian territories of the Northwest and of the Southwest. The new states will be Indiana and Illinois, Mississippi and Alabama. And these four states open up, and here comes a great migration into this region, or to these two regions, for agricultural purposes. You see a lot of farmers that will leave Georgia, the Carolinas, and make their way to southern Illinois and to southern Ohio, southern Indiana. A lot of southerners moved into the southern parts of these three states. At Ole Miss, we call those three states Little Dixie because so many Southerners flooded in there looking for farmland after the War of 1812. But also, you're gonna see a lot of Southerners flood into Alabama and Mississippi during this time period. And this big migration begins to happen across the country. You know, it's easy to kind of follow these migration patterns by looking at your family and your family history. You'll see your families moving as groups from one place to another place. Um, my family lived in Augusta, Georgia before, before the War of 1812 in that general area. In 1817, they started migrating toward Alabama. 
And what they did was they decided with their communities to, to build a new community in the new territory. And the people of Sparta, Georgia, decided to move to a new place called Sparta, Alabama. Sparta, Alabama is just north of Castleberry. It's outside the, it's between Castleberry and, and Evergreen. All right. What they did was very simple. They took the people, they divided people into work groups, and they went on, they went on a mission to Alabama to build that community. The, the first bunch that went out on, on this special mission are going to go over and survey the land for the new town. They lay the new town out. The next group comes in about six weeks later and they start laying out the streets. You got to build your streets first. All right. Once the streets have all been have all been established in, in the little town of Sparta, Alabama, the next work group comes in, and these are your construction workers. And they start building the buildings to build your downtown area. And what they did was they built the town in a square. And in the middle of that square will be the courthouse and the jailhouse. And all the roads will come into the corners of that square. So you got a circle main street to go out. You come in from the south, from the southeast, you got a circle main street and go out on the southwest side to leave town or the northwest side or the northeast side. They had it fixed so that your corners were your, where your roads came in. And they built their buildings. They built the courthouse, built the jailhouse. They built your hotel. They built your, your strip centers along the east side of the road here around the square. Uh, they brought in hotels. They brought in barber shops. They had both butcher shops. They had bakeries. The whole nine yards shows up here. So your artisans are going to move to town here in this time period. And Sparta also went and built a public school system. They used the old Northwest Territory uh, plan and they set aside land to be leased by a farmer that'll pay for the school system. So they had a public school here in Sparta, Alabama. This is around, seven, this is around 1817, 1819 time period. So they sent people over from Sparta, Georgia, Sparta, Alabama, every six weeks or so, and they went over and did a mission. They did some building. And with, once downtown is finished, then they start building individual homes. And once these homes are finished, people start migrating to Sparta, Alabama. And you can see it's all across the country, guys. You can follow the names of towns across the country and know who are traveling to these towns. Take the town of Greenville. We got Greenville, North Carolina. We got Greenville, South Carolina. We got Greenville, Georgia. We got Greenville, Tennessee. We got Greenville, um, Alabama. We got Greenville, Mississippi. We got Greenville, Arkansas, and Greenville, Louisiana, and Greenville, Texas, and Greenville, Oklahoma. And you can follow those Greenville people all across the country as they went to new locations during this time period. So if you're doing genealogy research and you can find out where your grandparents are from, your great grandparents, you can just trace them right on back by the towns. Churches also move like this. You know, there's a lot of churches across the South that, that moved to new locations as the land opened up. So between communities and churches, you see a lot of migration going on after the War of 1812, when all this Indian territory opened up for, for settlement here uh, from the people of Georgia, the Carolinas, Virginia, Pennsylvania, and so forth. And they all fledged these new territories. So that's pretty remarkable. We got four brand new states in a period of about four years. That's pretty quick goings here, guys, to do all this stuff. One of my favorite stories is the city of of Claiborne, Alabama. If you read a book called To Kill a Mockingbird, Claiborne, Alabama is Finch Landing. That's where Atticus Finch's family is from. And in the novel, Atticus Finch's family lived on the river. And that's where, that's where Finch Landing was located. Finch Landing is actually Claiborne. Now, where in the world is Claiborne, Alabama? Well, if you guys go up here to Bruton, and going up to Repton and make your way on 84 to Monroeville, and you keep on going about 20 more miles down the road, you'll come to the Alabama River on Highway 84. On the, on the north-hand side of that road is where the old city of Claiborne was located. When I was going to Ole Miss, I'd drive up on that road and I pulled off one afternoon and I walked out there on that property where the old city was. And you see the old foundations, you see the old water wells, 
and so forth. This town had close to 4,000 people who lived here. And Claiborne is a cotton city. It's a cotton town. If you travel at Highway 84, from all the way across Mississippi, from Alabama, you're gonna see nothing but cotton fields and cotton fields and cotton fields. The big thing up here is still cotton. And so Claiborne, Alabama becomes a big, a big cotton center. Well, the problem is the city was built about 75 feet above the river. Now there's some trails that go down to the landing here below that hill, but these folks wanted a quick way to get cotton bales down to the bottom of this, of this hill down to the landing. And so they built a staircase. The, the staircase is, six, is 365 steps. I want you guys to picture on your shoulders a, 50, a 500 pound cotton bale and you're walking down 365 steps to get to the bottom of that landing. That's pretty crazy. You don't need goals, Jim, if you're carrying cotton bales on your shoulder walking, walking down 365 steps. It's pretty exhausting. A lot of men tripped, a lot of men died because they fell down that, down that hillside. And so they decided to, put, to bring in a sliding board. They went through and built the scaffolding for this, for this device and they put some tin on it and they made a sliding board that went from the top of that hill down to the river. Well, here's the problem. If you put a cotton bale that weighs 500 pounds on a sliding board and you give it a good push, it's gonna get like 20 miles an hour when it gets to the bottom of that hill. And there's no way to stop it. And a lot of cotton bales ended up in the river. And of course that ruined them. The cotton bales got full of water and they sunk out there in the river. So they got the bright idea to bring barges up from Mobile and anchor barges at the end of that sliding board. And sometimes these barges was, was as far out as 30 feet into, into the river where they were anchored. And these bales would come sliding down and the men on the barges would catch the, the bales as they flew in here. Now, of course, if you get hit by a cotton bale, it's going it, to either gonna kill you or give you some serious injuries. So instead of putting slaves on the, on the big barges to, cut, to catch the cotton bales, they brought in Irishmen. Irishmen were, were, were a, a, a dozen for a nickel. They were very pre prevalent in Mobile during this time period. And so they brought the Irishmen up to catch the cotton bales on those barges. And then when the steamboats came in, they would load the cotton on the steamboats off the barges and the steamboat would head to Mobile where it'd be sold in the marketplace. Claiborne had close to 4,000 people who lived here. Pretty good sized town. They had a newspaper. The newspaper was published between 1830 and, 1840 and 1850. And University of West Florida has got copies of the newspaper from Claiborne. I've read the, I've read the papers out of Claiborne. And there's some interesting articles about the people who lived in Claiborne and what all they did for a living. All these artisans and lawyers and doctors and school teachers and, and various professional groups were in the city of Claiborne. What happened to Claiborne? What happened to Sparta? They're both, they're both ghost towns. Both cities were very, very prominent. They were doing extremely well for themselves until the early 1850s when yellow fever hit. And yellow, yellow fever decimated both towns. The people, the people in Claiborne are, are the people in Claiborne will move toward Grove Hill or move down toward Monroeville, and the city dies. The people at Sparta will either go to Bruton or they'll go to Evergreen. And both, and both these little towns here have gone away. I've been to both locations. I spent a little bit of time at Sparta and also at Claiborne to see this land because my people had lived here. My Weatherfords had moved from Sparta, Georgia to Sparta, Alabama. During any removal and being Weatherfords and associated as being Indian, which they were not, they were Englishmen, they decided to flee and they left Sparta and went up toward Meridian, Mississippi, where my, where my family is actually from on the Wedford side. We're from the Shelby County, Mississippi. So they all left here during any removal time period. But you can go through and look at these old towns and so forth. There's several books out about the ghost towns of Alabama. And uh, these are on there. Catawba's on there, the old state capital. There's quite a few towns that are listed on the old, the old ghost towns of Alabama here. But people started moving westward once, once the War of 1812 had ended. Go west, young man, go west. There's more opportunities to the west here. Well, a lot of owners of plantations are going to move west. And here's how they did it. Because all this land opened up for settlement, 
in the middle part of the country, United States Congress in 1819 is going to have a new land act. It's called the Land Act of, of 1819. This land act says that you can go out into the Western territories, the Western areas, the Western states by 1820. You can go and find land that's available for you. Go to the land office, and our big land office here was Elba. Elba, Alabama was a big land office here. Fort St. Stephens was the other one over here along the Tom Baby River. So we had two land offices. Once you got your land marked off, You'd go to the land office and you'd make a deed on it. Make sure the land is legally secured for you. And Congress says the price of land is going to be $100 for 80 acres. 80 acres for $100. That's a pretty good deal, guys. That's $1.25 an acre. Now, in this time period, if you own 40 acres of land, and you got like 20 acres in cotton production, you got 10 acres in, in forest, in forest, in, in woods. You got about five acres for your homestead and your garden and your barns and all that stuff. If you have 40 acres, you're middle class. You're doing pretty well for yourself. If you have 80 acres, you're doing, you're doing extremely well for yourself. 120 acres, 100, 180 acres, 300 acres, 400 acres, you got on up there. You got, you, you got very successful in, in, in your lives here by having all these acreage because you made more money off of it because you grew more crops. Most people, most people who had 80 acres, 100, 120 acres, whatever, usually had a large family. They'd have four or five sons in the family. So you had plenty of workers. If you did not have a lot of, a lot of boys in the family, the girls had to pitch in and do a lot of the work here. And some of these larger farmers would have one or two slaves. You saw more families across the South with one or two slaves than any other stat here in this time period. Plantations were few and far between. Remember, the South had less than 5% of the plant, of plantations. They were not very big. Only the extremely wealthy class had plantations. So less than 20% of the Southern people actually owned slaves during this time period. Okay, everybody wants to look at these large plantations. They were not that, they were not that common in a lot of places. You know, you see grouping some of them from time to time, but sometimes there are few and far between here, these large, these large old plantations that people try to romanticize and all this stuff. It's gone, it's not really here, guys. And, and most of these people didn't have, didn't have the big houses that you saw. They had big, huge farmhouses. They were built out of planks, and they were not the big, huge brick, brick made southern mansions here that everybody romanticizes about the old South, about the old antebellum period, which is dead and gone and will not come back. And so you have a small number of people who do have plantations during this time period. Most everybody were large owners of farms. They'd have, you know, they'd have up to 80 acres, 120 acres. My grandparents, Grandpa Weatherford had, had 240 acres in his farm in Neshoba County, Mississippi. My Grandpa Causey had 400 acres in Amit County, Mississippi. And they were middle-class farmers back in the 1940s and 1950s and 1960s. And they, they diversified what they had. They had a dairy farm. They grew cotton. They grew corn. They grew some wheat. They had a large gardens. They had a large, had a large number of hogs. They sold hogs. They also um, had tree farms. And every 20 years, they cut the timber and they went through and replanted in their tree farms. So everybody was diversified during this time period. By the 1970s, they're starting to grow soybeans on these farms. So you start seeing a lot of diversity take place here among these farmers that had more than 100 acres of land. Okay, so this Land Act is going to give the American people 80 acres of land for $100. What a deal. And the American people really picked up on it. Well, out here in Georgia and the Carolinas, on these large plantations, the owner of the plantation might go out and get 1,000 acres in Alabama, then get 1,000 acres in Mississippi, maybe 1,000 acres in Louisiana or Arkansas. He bought these large acreages of land to expand his wealth, but more importantly, give his sons a source of income for the future. 
if you had four boys, if you had four kids, four boys, the baby boy stayed at home. He did not move into the Western territories or to the Western states. You figure that youngest child would outlive you. And that youngest child would be your caretaker in your old age. He'd be the one who'll take care of you when you're unable to perform as you had once done. So the youngest kid stayed home. The other three boys got a chance for land in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Arkansas, wherever the old man bought, bought farmland. Okay? Once the land has been purchased and been secured, got the deed on it, you started sending work crews out to those new that new land to go through and start building the new plantations. They'd go and build the big house, the carriage house, the various barns, the kitchens. They'd go through and build the slave quarters and the, and the overseer's house. And they, they made, they made a, a building for the carpenter and coopers and, and sawyers and carpenters and blacksmiths and all these folks so they'd have a place to work out of. They also went through and built a big meal, a grist meal. Or a, a, or a grain meal where the miller would go through and thresh out the rice or go through and grind up the corn into corn meal and so forth. So all this was done. And once, the, once, these four, once these three plantations are finished across the South, everybody came back home. The old master wanted to give these boys a chance to get started with a large plantation and he, needed, he knew they needed workers. So he would take his slave families and line them up across the front lawn, across the grove, in front of the big house. And standing on the veranda, the porch of the big house, these three boys would go and pull straws. The one with a lot with a shorter straw would be the one who would go through it and, and, and choose his people first. And then the sec second boy, then the third boy. What they did was, was very simple. They divided up these slave families. They took men away from their wives. They took teenage boys away from their families. They towed to up these slave families. The slave families were nuclear families that were destroyed because they divided up the slaves to send them to new plantations. So if the old man had said, said for instance, he had 120 slaves, He'd be left with probably around 40 slaves when it's all said and done. Then he'd go to the slave market in Savannah or Columbia or Raleigh or whatever, and he'd try, try to buy enough people to make up the difference of what he had lost going to the Western territories. Those boys who went out toward Demopolis, Alabama, would go down to Mobile and on Dalton Street, go to the big slave market. And they'd buy people, go up the Tom Beebe River, up the Black Warrior River to their new plantations. Those folks around Mississippi, say around Crystal Springs or up toward Jackson in that area, they would go down to New Orleans and buy their slaves and have them transported to the Pearl River. Pearl River runs right to Jackson from the Gulf Coast. And, and here they deliver their, their new supply of slaves. Those who lived in Little Rock, or in that area of Arkansas, go to Little Rock's their slave market, and they would go through and buy slaves and then bring them up Arkansas River to the plantations. So you start seeing that this free port, they go down the Red River, down to Baton Rouge, or even to New Orleans, and buy slaves, and then have them transported back up by boat back to uh, Shreveport on the, on the Red River. So all this is taking place here, guys. They're trying to fill in what they can be, what they can do. I want to tell you something. This was very, very hard on slave families to have your loved ones removed and you have no idea of where they're going to. It's pretty hard. It's hard on the women folks who saw their little kids. Yeah, they took seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds away from their mamas and carried them to new plantations. And these mamas had no idea where their children were going off to. It's pretty sad, it's terrible. It got so bad, guys, in 1825 time period, Alabama outlawed the division of slave families. They made it illegal in Alabama for people to divide up their slave families and send them to new locations. They said these families should stay together as one group, okay? So some of the horrors of slavery, guys, goes a lot deeper than the abuse in the fields. 
There's a lot of mental abuse going on here. There's more than just physical abuse, okay? As a matter of fact, when slavery ended in 1866, it was passed in 65, but a lot of people were not freed until late in 1866. When the people were freed from slavery, one of their, they had two major missions. The first mission was to get married in the church, to make their, to make their marriages legal before the eyes of God. And you can start a lot of your family research by going to marriage records between 1865 and 1877 or 1880 time period and find these folks getting married in a church, seeing these folks get married legally and have a license from the state that they are married. The second thing was they wanted to find each other. They wanted to find each other. By this time, the old master and the old miss were, were aged. They were up in their 80s, early 90s. And a lot of these folks realized that they got to go before God and explain themselves because of slavery. That's why a lot of folks, before they died, would free their slaves, hoping to be repentant to enter heaven. Well, I want to tell you something. That's a little bit too late. It should have been done a long, long time before somebody got to the point they were scared to go before God. So these older white folks would be approached by the former slaves and they'd go and say, Miss Sally, do you remember my brother Otis? Do you remember my sister Dorothea? Do you remember my family that was divided on the plantation when you was a young girl? That your brother took my family to his plantation out in Alabama or, or out Mississippi? Do you know where my family is located? And sometimes these older women, these older men would tell these, these, age, these older slaves, the ones that have been freed, where their families were located. They started finding each other. They started finding each other. And some of the greatest reunions among the families took place when these 90-year-old mamas found their 70-year-old babies. They hadn't seen them in all that time. Sisters who are 85 years old were finally reunited. Brothers found brothers. And all of a sudden, the whole family will come together. There might be eight or nine or 10 or 12 children here, guys, in their 70s and their 80s who finally find each other. How remarkable is that? It's just amazing. But it took some letter writing. It took some, some research, some investigation, some begging of the older white folks until you finally found your families. Don't you realize, guys, a lot of stuff takes place here as these folks try to find each other once slavery has ended, okay? So marriage and the family. That is two of the most important things here, guys, in our society is the family. Bringing the family together here and keeping everybody close together during this time period, okay? So, guys, the people here are going to start finding one another. Now, I want you to know about another thing, too. It's because of cotton that all this happened. I believe if Eli Whitney had not gone to Savannah, Georgia in 1793, that maybe by 1800 or 1808 when the African slave trade came to an end, they might have rethunk it and done away with it. By 1810, it's too late. Cotton has already taken off, and people are very interested in growing cotton. And across the South, they start building all these, all these plantations, all these farms here off this land act of 1820 or 1819, trying to expand cotton culture. And cotton culture is going to go all the way to Texas. It will not slow down. It's going to go all the way to Texas here in this time period. And slavery expands very quickly here. Okay? And, of course, they call cotton white gold. And the, and the white men got rich off of the back of their their of their friends or their neighbors, I should say, their their actual family members that came from Africa, and they abused these folks, and they did not take care of these folks. 
Uh, some of the slave owners did take care of the, of the people, a lot did not. So you kind of get an idea. If you guys want to see a real good description of what's going on here, y'all need to go and watch Unchained Memories. It's on, it's, on the, it's on the podcast, the video link on Blackboard. And go down and find the Oprah Winfrey program on HBO Films that's called Unchained Memories. And y'all need to watch it. They use the old slave narratives from the 1930s to make this movie. Y'all know in the 1930s, we had over 100,000 people who were born in slavery still alive in America. If you were born in 1830, you were a slave until you was almost 30 years, 35 years old. And you will remember it all this. If you were born in 1840, in 1850, in 1850, if you were born in 1850, you were 15 years old when slavery ended. And all these folks here in the 1930s started telling what it was like to be enslaved. You don't need to watch this stuff. The American people need to watch this program. They got to understand where all the stuff today is coming from and all the hurt and all the cruelty and all the meanness that took place that people want to go through and rewrite the history of. And you cannot re rewrite the history. They go, oh, it's so negative. We can't have negative stuff being talked to our kids about America. In history, you have the good and you have the bad. And a, and a historian does not overlook either side. You tell it the way it is, hoping that future generations will not repeat the horrors that took place in this time period. You know, speaking of the horrors that took place during this time period, in 1836, the people of the South got concerned because of abolitionism. The abolitionists were writing newspapers and writing articles and magazines and all this stuff trying to outlaw slavery. They're trying to convince the American people that slavery should be ended. This is 1836. One of your big leaders of this group was named Mr. William Lloyd Garrison. Mr. Garrison wrote a newspaper called The Liberator, an anti-slavery publication. Well, the Southern people got concerned because this literature was coming to the South. We had a bookseller in downtown Mobile on Dolphin Street whose last name was Strickland. And Mr. Strickland had a big newsstand downtown on Dolphin Street. And he carried these abolitionist magazines in his bookstore, in his magazine shop. And the people of Mobile got mad about it. They went in there and burned him out and, and hauled him out of town and ran him off. Is that violation of the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press? And these Southerners wants this ended. Now remember, Andrew Jackson is president during this time period. And the Southern congressional members are going to come together and they put together a new law called the Gag Act, that's spelled G-A-G. -G. You're going to gag the abolitionists in this time period. You're going to try to put them down. The United States Congress guys, under Andrew Jackson's leadership, out of, out of his persuasions, I should say, out of his agenda, is probably more the more accurate term, passed this gag act. And this act said you cannot send an anti-slavery abolitionist materials to the American South. It's against the law. It's against federal law to do so. If they catch you in mailing this out, the postmaster general can come after you and have you arrested for sending stuff through the mail. Crazy, crazy law. When they passed this law in 1836, Southerners put a clause on it that is illegal to teach your slaves how to read and write. In 1836, it's illegal to teach your slaves how to read and write. Well, guys, some slaves were taught how to read and write. A lot of these old masters had children who came out of the, out of the quarters. They had African-American mamas, but the daddy was the old master or the son of, one, of, of the old master or the overseer's son. And oftentimes, the old master would go and take favor of these children because they were his children to a certain extent. In the slave narratives, I just mentioned about an unchained memory. You have a young man that talks about how his daddy is the owner of the plantation. And he goes to town, he buys them stuff. 
He buys them shoes and clothing, buys them candy and so forth, and brings it to his children who live in the slave quarters. Virginia Fox Genovese writes about this in her book, The Plantation Household, and how this took place. And so these, some of these children who are African-American and also European in DNA, they have a chance to learn how to read. And sometimes the old master took these young people that he had out of the slave quarters and he taught them how to read and write. A lot of them were his accountants. A lot of them did the inventories on the farm. A lot of them were overseeing the production inside of the dairy barn, the milk production. Some of them were the overseers that overlooked the artisans. Some were overseers on the, in the fields that oversaw the work conditions. A lot of your cooks, a lot of your butlers, a lot of your dry, carriage drivers were the children of the old master whose wives or who, whose mates were the slave women. And you see a lot of this going on here, guys, during this time period. All right. And those, those kids were allowed to learn how to read and write on, in, a, in a lot of cases. Now they cannot. They cannot read and write after 1836. It's against the law. One of the slave narratives that I read out of North Carolina that was written, eight, that was written in 1936 by the, by the, uh, by the uh, federal writers, in the federal writers project here at the time period that FDR put together. One of the ladies here out of, Greens, out of Greensboro, North Carolina, went up toward the, the northern part of the state of North Carolina, up there above Durham, and started interviewing former slaves. This young college girl goes to a household with an older man. He's in his 90s. And the man has deep scars around his eyes. He cannot see. And she asks him, what happened to your eyes? And he says, oh, sister, when I was about six years old, I was allowed to go to the big house to play with the white kids because they were my brothers and sisters. My brothers and sisters were the white kids at the big house and my mama was a cook and they allowed me to go up there and play with my brothers and sisters. The old master enjoyed my company from time to time. But he says around 10 o'clock each morning, the old tutor came up. That old tutor would run me off. I couldn't stay there. This is the early 1840 time period. I couldn't stay there. And I wanted to learn so badly that I had a burning desire to learn. Then one afternoon, the old master had left and left some of his books there on the table inside the big house. And while nobody was looking, I reached in there and I pulled out the old blue book speller, the old Noel Webster blue book speller. And I put that book inside of my britches and up under my shirt, and I took off down to the slave quarters to our little home. And I hid the book under the mattress of the bed. And he says every night when mama went to bed, I'd lay there with her for a few minutes until she was snoring, she was sound asleep, and he would get up and go to the fireplace. The fire had been banked, so it would not flare up during the night. And over the side of the fireplace was a bucket full, full of kindling. Kindling is what you use to get your fire started. So I reached in there, I got me a little pot, got me a little pine, a little pine torch, put in those ashes, and got it lit up. It looks kind of like a little flashlight. He gave enough light to like a flashlight would. And he would sit there at the heart of that fireplace, feet crossed, laying there on his stomach studying that blue book speller. He did it night after night after night. It's like you guys getting your Harry Potter book when you're like nine years old, getting under the covers with your flashlight to read it. One evening about midnight, the front door was busted open and there stood the overseer. Boy, what are you doing? You're not against the law to be for you to be reading. You can't be reading. It's only for white folks. 
and he threw that torch in the fireplace, took that book out of the little boy's hands and grabbed that little kid and hauled him out of the house. Mama hollering and screaming, what's going on? What's going on? Put down my baby, what's going on? This overseer took that child to the smokehouse and he tied him up in the smokehouse. The next morning, they built a raging fire in the middle of the slave quarters. And in that fire was placed some branding irons. That overseer told all the slave people to come together around that fire. He's going to teach them a lesson. If you want to learn how to read, here is your punishment. And he took that baby, that little eight-year-old, and burned his eyes out with those branding irons. When slavery ended, one of the first things we did was create what is called the Freedmen's Bureau to help these former slaves get some land to live on, a place to live, trying to get these people in middle class as quickly as possible, and bring in schools. Education is the most important part of the Freedmen's Bureau. Okay? You realize that you cannot function in a democracy unless you're educated, unless you can read and write. And that's one of the first agendas of the Freedmen's Bureau. And they're going to continue the mission of having schools here across the country. And a lot of these schools are still open. You go to Fisk University, go to Morehouse College, go to, go to Howard College, go to um, um, Florida A&M. All these colleges were opened here, guys, by the Freedmen's Bureau. It was part of the deal here to make sure that black students had a chance for education. The white schools were not sponsored. Tuskegee came out of all of this. And Jackson State and Alabama State and Shaw University. All this came out of this, out of this movement here, guys. Hampton Institute. It all came from this group here, guys, who wants to make sure that these former slaves are educated. Okay, and they excelled. The white folks were always worried that if the slave people were educated, they'd be smarter than the white folks. Okay. So guys, a lot of stuff comes out of this time period that people need to know about. Oh, it might be negative, but this negative is going to try to change America. You got to see the bad before the good shows up. You got to go through and turn the light on sometimes to find the problem. Okay, just get what's going on here in this time period. Okay, another major migration came into Florida during this time period. A lot of folks started flooding into Florida here. Uh, the Seminole Indians will have a war against the Americans in, in 1817 time period. Andrew Jackson comes in here. And the areas north of Gainesville become pretty well stabilized for American farmer, for American farmers. And a lot of folks out of North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia are going to come to Florida. Now, guys, they go to Walton County and to Mariana at Chipola on the Chipola River. If they go on down toward Gaston and Gaston County, down toward Leon County, on down toward, down, down toward Madison and Tallahassee, I mean, down toward uh, Jacksonville, you'll see a lot of farming going on up here. There's a lot of cotton farmers from Jackson County that live on the Chipola River here down below Mariana. There's a lot of cotton farmers in North Walton County uh, during this time period. The Native Americans are, have been subdued and the farmers are coming in here. A lot of these farmers are not really farmers, they're ranchers. Their main business is cattle production. They'll go through and have large herds of cattles, cattle. They'll range these cattle, which means they don't have them fenced up. They just range them around the countryside. The cows can wander. The horses can wander from place to place. The most important thing is you got to make sure that your animals are branded. And every spring when the new calves show up, they go into the woods of Florida, find that old, find that old mama cow, and maybe her baby or two that she might have had during the springtime. You can tell whose babies they are because cows are very socialized. And these mama cows take care of their babies like your, like your dog takes care of her puppies. Or your cat takes care of her kittens. 
And you know who they belong to because they're always nursing or hanging around the mama cow. The mama cow's got a brand on her that's your brand and you go through and brand those two calves with your brand. And you let them range, you let them, you let them range. When the winter time comes, you have a big roundup. You send out your cowboys. And these cowboys go and round up these cows and bring them back to the farm where they're gonna have them pinned up during the winter time. When the springtime comes again and it's nice and warm, they let the cows out. So guys, the American cowboy does not begin in Texas. The American cowboy, the first wild west is gonna be Florida. The library here in Valparaiso got quite a few Florida cowboy books. They deal with the history of cowboys here in Florida. Very interesting reading to, to read here about the Florida cowboys. And of course they migrated. They took their cows and their horses and their, and their other animals and they ranged them across the Southeast. Went to Louisiana, went to Arkansas with them, went to Texas with them, and finally went across the West to California. So the original cowboys came from Florida. I'm telling you guys, y'all don't realize how much local history we have in this class and what all Florida did in this class, okay? By 1812 time period, 1814 time period, Spain has realized that she has gotten all she can get out of the new world, that she's plundered and stole and pillaged and there's nothing much left. And so Spain decides to leave the new world, to leave the Americas. Okay, as early as 1812, they're going to tell the people who live in Mexico that we're leaving to start working toward your own constitution and your own way of governing yourselves. In 1821, Mexico becomes an independent country. They become a republic. They write a constitution, okay? They have free elections. Venezuela, Colombia, Costa Rica, Belize, Guatemala, Chile, Ecuador, Brazil, Argentina. They're going to start seeing all these Europeans leaving and going home. And these countries begin to form their own democracies here in this time period. Okay? They all start forming these own democracies. The only place that Spain remains is going to be Cuba. They'll be here until the late 1800s. In 1898, the United States makes war against Spain because of the atrocities taking place in Cuba. Yeah, they brought the Inquisition into Cuba in the 1890s and started killing people. They started having, having various kinds of death camps and various kinds of, of um, of uh, murder going on here among the people who resisted the Spanish rule in this time period. So all this takes place, a Holocaust shows up here, guys in Cuba. And the American press gets on all this stuff. And by 1898, we've declared war on Spain and the war will be fought in the Philippines and in Cuba. And we get rid of the Spanish. Okay. So guys, Spanish Florida becomes opened up when Spain decides to leave the new world. Secretary of State is John Quincy Adams. And John Quincy Adams believes in good borders. He said it's time for us to go through and, and finalize the borders between us and Spain. Well, Spain said, don't worry about Florida. We're kind of tired of Florida anyway. And so therefore, we'll let y'all buy it for $5 million. This is part of what's called the, uh, the Adams Onis Treaty. It's about O-N-I-S. It's John Quincy Adams and, and the Otis, Mr. Otis Treaty. I mean, Mr. Uh, yeah, Otis Treaty here at the time period. Okay? O-N-I-S is Onis. Florida really didn't cost us anything. The $5 million were for lawsuits, mainly from the Seminole War time period. So in 1821, Spain hands over Florida to the United States. 
Florida as a territory until March the 3rd, 1845. On March the 3rd, 1845, Florida is going to gain statehood. Okay, it's going to be a long time coming. Your first territorial governor of Florida is going to be Andrew Jackson. He comes as your first territorial governor. Okay? So people start really flying to Florida after 1821. Now, there'll be more wars against Seminoles. They're going to cause some havoc down here. This, they're being invaded by the white folks. They try to fight back, protect their property. In 1835 and 1836, 37 time period, you have what is called the Second Seminole War. This is where Billy Bowlegs and, and, uh, and um, Osceola are part of. There's another major conflict in the, in the mid-1840s before Florida's to gain statehood. So you have these little wars that break out from time to time. Or they also try to round up some of the old Indians to get them to Oklahoma during the end removal time period. Well, these folks went to the swamps of South Florida down around Okeechobee and they could not be flushed out. They were here to stay down here in this region. They could not get, they could not capture them to get to haul them out to Oklahoma. So they signed us, they kind of settled here in South Florida. But all of our area becomes open, guys. You start seeing people come to a Tunisville and Valparaiso area as early as the 1830s, mid-1830s. Uh, there's families that made, that made land deals out of Pensacola and moved over here. One of the biggest concerns of the, of the new frontier of Northwest Florida and what is now Wilkeloose and Walton counties, the big problem was rattlesnakes. This place was a country full of rattlesnakes. And they went through and tried to burn the woods off, trying to kill the rattlesnakes. We had big forest fires here, trying to kill the rattlesnakes. These knuckleheads didn't know the rattlesnakes live with the gophers. The, gophers, the gopher turtle digs holes, and the rattlesnake lives with the gopher turtle. They're roommates all during cold weather. So burning off the woods did no good. They had big bear hunts trying to run the bears out of here. They had lots of bears. They had Florida panthers to deal with. You had alligators to deal with. Y'all read the early histories of Walton County. McKenna wrote a book in, in 1901 on the history of Walton County. And I have the book of the Valparaiso Library. And it's some interesting reading about how these people came in here to settle here as early as 1835 and the problems they had trying to settle here, okay? Trying to come in with, that, with, their, with their cracker culture, herding cattle and herding horses and trying to raise hogs. And of course, they discovered the fishing here in this area. And by the 1860s, 1870s, we're heavily involved in going into the bays and into the Gulf to get fish, starting a small fishing industry here. By 1910 and 1920, here comes a major fishing with internal combustion engines on the boats. And so Valparaiso, Niceville, Destin, Count Walton, Freeport, Port Washington, you're gonna start seeing all kinds of fishing and all kinds of shrimping going on here in this region. It's gonna be a major change take place. You're gonna see the timber business boom in Northwest Florida once the railroads come in in the mid 1880s. We're gonna build a railroad from Crestview to Florella just for the timber business. It's called the Yellow River Railroad Company. It ran up through Laurel Hill. You guys who live in Crestview, that railroad track ran across right in front of the high school. When you get when you go on, when you go on Commerce Drive heading to the library, you, you cross over that little street that's just on the right hand side of Highway 85. That's the old railroad tracks. They ran all the way to Crestview and to Laurel Hill and on to Florella. When I was a little boy living in, living in Laurel Hill in the late 1950s, early 1960s, the train came through Laurel Hill. I'd go down there and watch the train come by and get a whooping for going off down the train track by myself when I'm six years old. <laughs> I want to see that train. And of course, I saw the guys who rode the trains, the old hobos who owned the trains and all these homeless men up and come walking up down the streets and came off the trains looking for something to eat. It's just a lot of stuff here, guys, you know, in our history of Northwest Florida. That's why Laurel Hills baseball and basketball, basketball teams are called the hobos because Laurel Hill was a great place together for hobos because every little old lady in town would feed them. 
to go to the back porch of the house and she'd come out and greet them and bring them some turnip greens and cornbread and some pork chops and potato salad and the whole nine yards. And they knew whose house to go to in Laurel Hill to get a good feeding. The one who made the best banana pudding and the one who had the best cakes and pies. It's amazing, all right? So a lot of local history here, guys, in this lecture from this time period. Because we're starting out here in the, in the late 1830s, we're getting started as an area for settlement. People coming in here, okay? A part of this new cotton culture, the expansion of, of all of this is going on during this time period, okay? So the Land Act of 1819, 1820 will give the American people 80 acres of land for $100, and they jumped on it. They really jumped on it, okay? I mentioned a while ago about Napoleon being defeated here in 1815. A lot of folks thought that Napoleon was the Antichrist. They believe the end of time is coming because Napoleon has been defeated. Okay. 1816. South Pacific. Just above Australia is a group of islands. It's called the Solomon Chain but it's called Java. And in Java in 1816, we had three major eruptions of volcanoes. They put billions of tons of ash into the atmosphere. This ash begins to travel into the trade winds, and this ash is gonna come into our country through Hawaii and on up toward Washington State, it comes in from the West Coast. And this big, thick ash is going to block the sunlight across North America. We get about five degrees cooler than we ever was, was before. We call this a little ice age. In Boston, July the 4th, 1816, it snowed seven inches on the 4th of July in Boston. The ash goes across Europe, England, and all of Europe. Their crops fail. People die because there's not, a food, not enough food to feed the people of Europe. A major disaster takes place here, guys. And a lot of folks think this is the beginning of the end of time. Okay, this little ice age is going to really disrupt world affairs. Okay, so we're worried about global warming. The earth can cool us off pretty quickly through volcanoes. Y'all realize that? We go have four or five major volcanoes that erupt. The Mount Vesuvius is to re-erupt and these, these volcanoes down here in, in Java re-erupt and the volcanoes here in North America like Yellowstone decides to erupt again and the, and the, big, and the big huge volcanoes in Iceland begin to erupt again. We could see a worldwide covering of ash. The whole world, the whole earth could be covered in ash, and we could drop 10, 12, 15, 20 degrees below normal because of this cooling off period. And it's amazing with this, with this pandemic going on, the earth has gotten a little bit better. Pollution has gotten a little bit better, except for the California fires. But the pollution here around the world is better because we're not flying all these jet airliners, and, and uh, the, the environment is kind of cleaning itself up. So there is hope that we can go through and, and reverse global warming and a volcano or two will really take care of the situation. Maybe it's more so they want to know about. You know, I truly believe that this is what caused the ice ages. Either the volcanoes came around the earth erupted or either a meteorite came in here and hit us. And that's what caused the ice age at less than some 35 or 40,000 years. All right. So it's interesting you look at all this history here, guys. Because of this little volcano, this little, this little ice age here, you're going to start seeing new religions. You're going to start seeing new denominations of religions to evolve from this. And here in America, they'll have three new churches that are apocalyptic churches because they believe that Christ's return is imminent. The Millerites. William Miller started a group called the Millerites. They're up here in the Midwest, up here in Ohio area. Several thousand of these people up here. And they joined William Miller. And Mr. Miller told them the time of, the time of Christ's return is coming. 
He says, October 22nd, 1843, Jesus is going to be here. He's going to show up. And he told his membership to sell everything you own. Sell your houses, sell your furniture, sell your clothing, sell your farm animals, sell your farms. Go to a mercantile shop, sell your clothes, and buy a white robe for every member of the family. And then give your money to charity. And they come together here, guys, here in October of 22nd, 1843. They got together out here, went to a hillside to pray all night, waiting for Christ's return. They were nude under these white bathrobes. They had no money. They had nothing left. They're all barefooted. You know they got cold up here in October in Ohio. The next morning, Christ did not come back. He didn't show up. And these folks are heavily agitated toward William Miller. You know, I'm going to give y'all a, I'll give y'all a bad joke here. I wonder if William Miller called communion Miller time. I know it's bad. <laughs> All right. His group are going to form a new church group, a new domination who calls themselves the Seventh Day Adventists. And they're around. We got a church here in Fulton Beach. Down here, down here in the, in the church part of town. And they are very prevalent, very, very interesting group of people who come together and worship here. Okay. The other group were called the Oneidas. John Humphrey Knowles, N-O-Y-E-S. John Humphrey Knowles is going to start off the Oneida group. This is a church that has free love going on. It's not a bunch of hippies. And of course, they were formed out here in western Massachusetts, exactly where Woodstock took place. New York State, that same little area out there. And this bunch believed in free love. Okay? So you have the Oneida group that is formed during this time period. And then you have a young boy in the early 1830s, he's about 13 years of age, that has a sickness, an illness. He runs a high fever. And during his illness, an angel comes to him and gives him a book of theology, a book of Mormons, as it was called during this time period. His name is Joseph Smith. This little kid recovers and starts trying to build up his new church group. All right, trying to build his new church group. Well, guys, the people out here in Western New York do not like his theology. They said that he's gone through and he has taken scripture and he's twisted it and all this kind of stuff. They do not like his theology. And his church group is forced to move. They go to Indiana. And here in Indiana, they're going to find more persecutions. And they finally move to Illinois. And here, Joseph Smith is murdered. And his church group is going to try to find a way to go somewhere where they're not molested. And here comes the new leader, whose name is Brigham Young. And this is during the time period, guys, just after the Mexican War. This is the late 1840s. And we've just taken all this territory out west, away from Mexico, including California and Texas. And on the northern end of this new territory is a Great Salt Lake. And Brigham Young says, we are going to go to the Great Salt Lake. We're going to a new promised land. And here we're going to build our new kingdom just for our people. I want you guys to get a chance sometime to read or watch a movie that deals with the Mormon people going across the country. These people literally drug their stuff across the desert, across the Great Plains. I mean, drug it. They made wheelbarrows to carry stuff in. They had little small carts they built to push stuff across the deserts. I want you guys to go to the beach sometimes with a wheelbarrow and see what kind of job it is going across the beach in a wheelbarrow. All right, that's a walk across it, much less go through and try to push something across it. A lot of folks died in this movement across the country to the Great Salt Lake. And when they arrived, Brigham Young says, we're going to build our city here, we're going to build our tabernacle here, and we shall live in freedom for the next 2,000 years. That nobody will mess with us for over 2,000 years. You know, when Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Purchase Territory from the French in 1803, he told the American people it'll take us 2,000 years to occupy this land. 
2,000 years occupied this land. We did less than 80. Earl Brigham Young only had two years. Actually, only had about 18 months. As soon as everything kind of started in Salt Lake City and building this new religious frontier for the Mormon people, the California Gold Rush starts. And you have hundreds of thousands of young people who head to California to get rich quick. They came right through Salt Lake City. They were invaded here, guys. A lot of these kids who did not make it rich out in California came back to Salt Lake City, back to Utah to live. And Nevada. And California. It's amazing. So Brigham Young is going to carry these folks out here to the promised land. And the promised land is going to be a very short-lived opportunity for these folks. Okay? The one thing about the Mormon church is this. They're very family-oriented. They're very much into genealogy. If any of you guys want to do your genealogy, go to the Mormon church down here in Fulton Beach across from Bruner Middle School, and they will help you out. They're very good at what they do down here. I'd call before I went and make sure they got there open. But they do help you with genealogy. They have the best records. There's over 3 billion records in the Mormon church that deals with genealogy. And I have used these folks a lot. I have worked a lot with the Mormon church here in Fulton Beach. And, uh, and trying to get materials and stuff for the library and our genealogy department, our genealogy section. So you start seeing, guys, an importance toward the family. And the Mormon church is today's largest growing church because they're family-oriented. Getting back to the family. You know, I always said that America needs to get back to the front porch. Y'all, you guys missed the front porch. In the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, the front porch where it all took place. On the afternoons, you go to the front porch and sit out there and read your newspaper, and your neighbors would walk up and sit down with you. And you started talking. As the neighbors all started gathering in on your front porch to talk and laugh and tell jokes and pick on one another, the women folks would come over and go in the kitchen with the wife, and they'd be in there having their good time too. The kitchen was the place for the women. The front porch was the place for men. While they're in there, they say, you know what? I have some leftovers here. You guys got any leftovers? Let's go up there and have a little dinner out here on the porch. And they'd all get together, guys. My sister's like, they got some dinner already. It might be a banana sandwich and some tomato sandwiches. It might have might been some soup or maybe some pulled pork sandwiches. But they got it together and everybody out on the porch. They made sweet tea. They had cakes and cookies. They cut watermelons, and people lived on the front porch. It'd be 10 o'clock at night for everybody went home because the front porch was a gathering place, and you knew your neighbors. I have got five neighbors around me out here. I'm on the corner here on Aurora Street, Valparaiso, and I have five or six real close neighbors. I only know two of them. I only know two of them. I know one a little bit because when the dogs get out of the house, when Luke, when Luke runs off on me, he'll head across the street to the neighbor's house and she'll catch him for me and I'll go over to the collar and bring him back home. We don't know our neighbors anymore, guys. When I was going to church, we had big, huge church socials at least once a month, if not twice a month. We had dinner on the grounds where people brought their Sunday dinners to church and we ate at picnic tables around the church on the outside. We don't do this anymore. We've got to get back to the basics of how it used to be, guys. And y'all would love that watermelon on that front porch. And y'all would love those pecan pies, and those apple pies, and those ch chocolate pies. And all those goodies we ate on the front porch here. My grandpa would go off to, to, the, to the ice house in Liberty, Mississippi. When, his, when all the people came over to his house, he'd be gone for about 30 minutes. He'd take his 45 zinc tub with him. At the ice house, he had that tub full of ice, of chipped ice. He bought rock salt. He also bought several dozen colas, sun drops and Cokes and Pepsis and the whole nine yards. And he'd come back with all those colas inside that ice in that big, huge zinc tub. And they bring out the ice cream freezers, the ice cream churns. And those ladies get in there and make that homemade ice cream uh, batch, pour it into those big, huge metal cylinders, hook up the ice cream machines to it. We hand cranked it. They put salt and rock salt around that ice. We had ice cream, had ice cream going on. You guys haven't had any, ice, any homemade ice cream, you have missed out. 
blue bells as close as you can get to it. There's some good stuff here, guys. So you start seeing all this socialization taking place here in these communities, in these towns, and people start really enjoying each other's company. Okay? So I want you guys to realize that America is coming into a new age here in this period of time. Work's going to change during this time period. When John Quincy Adams and John and John uh, and, and uh, Harry um, Henry Clay, get the name right. When Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams go across the Atlantic Ocean to the treaty at Ghent, Belgium, it's six weeks over. It's going to be six weeks back. And these two men start discussing a new economy for the American people. It is called the market revolution. We're going to start building a marketplace. In order to build a marketplace, you've got to start with your infrastructure. You've got to start with your infrastructure. So Congress appropriates funding here to start building canals and roads. The Erie Canal is the first one they did. That's the E-R-I-E, -E, the Erie Canal. It's going to run from Lake Erie to, to, to Buffalo, New York, and right on into Albany. At Albany, it'll hook into the Hudson River. So now you have a 350 mile long canal that runs from Buffalo, New York, across to Albany and comes southward on the Hudson River to New York City. This canal is finished in 1825. DeWitt Clinton, the governor of New York, is the one who got this started. While they're building the canal, New York City is going through major renovations. Manhattan means Island of Hills. New York was extremely hilly. And between 1815 and 1830, they're going to tear down sections of town and level out the hills. That's why you guys go to New York City and y'all stand down at the Battery and look up Broadway. You'll see the rise. You'll see it rise up. That's why. They level the land off. They ran the streets north and south from the Battery to Harlem and from the Hudson River to the East River. And they built this grid section across New York. If you guys haven't been to New York City, y'all need to go. It's a wonderful place to go to, a place to see. I went in the early 1980s, and I tell you what, New York was fantastic in the 1980s. I can imagine what it's going to be like today to go up there and see all this stuff. Okay? So New York City is going to be transformed during this time period. When the Erie Canal opens up, the people of New Orleans – are going to get left out. All the trade from the Great Lakes, from Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, is going to go to the Great Lakes and go down the go down the Erie Canal to New York on the Hudson. And New Orleans gets cut off. New York City becomes the largest city in America. You have close to 500,000 people living there by the 1830s. It's a real big melting pot city. And every year, the New York roads will grow by 10 miles. So you take all the roads across New York heading northward, there might be 30 or 40 of them, but all total, they encompass 10 new miles of growth. It's every year here, guys. So New York City goes to a major transformation here in the 1830s and 1840s. By the 1880s, they're starting to build multi-story buildings. When steel comes in, you're going to start seeing the rise of buildings. By the 1930s, we're testing how high can we go. You'll have the Chrysler Building, and you'll have the new, and you'll have the Empire State Building. They'll be built during this time period. And here comes the high rise city. in the 1960s. Here comes the World Trade Centers. Okay. And by the way, these large, tall buildings in New York City were built by the Mohawk Indians because they're not scared of heights. I can see us guys up there 40 stories above the ground walking on metal beams. There ain't no way I'd be up there trying to hug that beam. I don't want to fall off of it. So New York City starts growing during this time period. You start seeing a major change in our cities during this time period. Okay, you're gonna start seeing mayors. You'll start seeing police departments and fire departments. You're going to start seeing all kinds of waterworks. In New York City, they built the, the, the big, huge 
uh, waterway on the east side of town, the aqueduct they built here. And they start bringing water into the city. You'll start seeing sewage being brought in, sewage systems. The only problem is the sewage systems ran into the rivers. At your big rainstorm, and remember guys, you're pulling wagons with mules and so your streets are full of manure. That's why you had little boys with brooms that swept you, up, swept you across the street. And you girls, y'all had skirts that hit the ground and you'd go home and your bottom of your dresses would have cow manure or horse manure all over, just totally filthy. These little boys had brooms and they'd sweep, sweep a path across the road for you, we call them street sweeps during this time period. Every household had an outhouse behind the house. That was your bathroom. You didn't have the indoor plumbing. The outhouse was usually about a six foot deep hole. They usually had two ringers inside of the outhouse. So y'all set up there together as pairs doing your business. You didn't have any toilet paper, so you used old magazines. A lot of people use corn cobs. You could use a corn cob four times. You could use it, then turn it, then use it, then turn it, and so forth. My dad told me corn cobs, corn cobs are pretty bad on hemorrhoids. All right. They put leaves in there. And sometimes some knucklehead would put some poison ivy leaves in there. So you had a hard time getting yourself clean because you didn't have any charming during this time period. And these outhouses would fill up pretty quickly. If you had eight kids in a household, these six foot deep holes filled up pretty quickly. When they filled up, you called the honey dippers. That's your first plumbers. They'd come out there and disassemble your house, open up that hole and use buckets to scoop all that manure out of those holes and pour it into their big, huge wagon that was covered in tar. Your first rhino linings were tar. And of course, they were not waterproof. They'd be dripping all over town if, if they leave your place if they get the hole cleaned out. Do you imagine what kind of job that was to have every day dealing with somebody else's manure and trying to get out of their backyards? And they'd go to the river and dump the stuff into the river. After a big rainstorm and all the streets got cleaned off of all the horse manure, your drinking water was like a smoothie. And you wonder how come they got cholera during this time period and all kinds of intestinal problems during this time period? They were drinking polluted water out of these rivers that were full of manure. That's pretty bad. So you see, you see the importance now of making sure we take care of our pollutants and try, try, try to take care of, of, of our waste materials and make sure it's handled in a safe manner. When I was a kid here in Valparaiso, all the sewage went to the bays. Nassau, Eglin, Valparaiso, Eglin put jet fuel into the bay. Shalimar, right, Ocean City. Cinco Bayo, by uh, Portland Beach, and Navarre, and all these towns for Foresa, for I mean for Forosa, um, uh, Destin, and it killed our waterways here. The sound was totally dead. The bay was totally dead. There's no fish such as bay, not a fish at all. In the 1980s, we started trying to replenish and trying to clean up our waterways. And now today. In Valparaiso, we got manatees out here in the bay in Valparaiso. We got baby sharks being born in the bays here in Valparaiso. We got dolphins being born up here in Tom's Bayo in Valparaiso. We've totally cleaned up. We got a big seafood industry down here at the foot of the hill below my house on, on John Sims Parkway. And Matt and his bunch have got a very successful seafood business going. They're doing most, most of fishing out of the bays and in, 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 in the end of the Gulf areas here. So you start seeing with us clean up and change here because of this. But pollution was extremely bad here in this time period. People were dying from pollution. And plus, your, your, your fossil fuel is coal. We're, we're burning coal in our fireplaces and in our industrial plants to make steam to power the machines with. Coal is highly toxic. And coal produces a lung disease as a pandemic that is called tuberculosis. In the 1800s and early 1900s, we had a pandemic of tuberculosis in America. And there's no cure for it. A lot of folks were told you get tuberculosis, go to a dry area. A lot of people went out to Arizona, California, trying to handle up with tuberculosis. They were also told, told to go to salty areas. We had lots of salt air. 
Jacksonville, Wakala Springs, Panama City, our area was extremely popular for people with tuberculosis to go to trying to get salt air to help them with their, with their lung disease. So guys, pollution causes death here in America during this time period with the burning of coal. And you won't see a, a cure for tuberculosis, you won't see a cure for TB until the 1940s when penicillin comes out. It'll be a long time. I've had, fam I had many family members in the past who died from tuberculosis. Okay, it's a major problem here, guys, that it's caused by pollution here. So you start seeing the rise of your cities during this time period. Your largest city is gonna be New York, followed by Baltimore, then Philadelphia, then Boston, then it goes on down to St. Louis and New Orleans and Savannah, Georgia, and so forth, okay? But remember, guys, the largest American cities during this time period are located on the Atlantic Ocean. The older cities of America are still your largest cities in this time period. So I should ask you where the cities were located during this time period, the big cities, they're located on the Atlantic Ocean. They're located on the land on the Atlantic coastline. We all remember all that stuff. Okay, so guys, you got a lot of stuff going on here. Now, with the American system, not only are you trying to improve your cities, not only are you trying to improve your your highways and build canals, you're going to start seeing construction of what is called turnpikes. This is your first interstate highways. You want to call them that. They're more like they're more like dirt path, like dirt paths through the woods. Okay, what they did here, guys, they started building roads westwardly. They built roads out of Pennsylvania, heading across the country. All right, they started building roads to carry trade goods to the marketplace. That's why it's called a market revolution. Raw materials go up the roads, go into the industrial plants. They manufacture the goods. It goes to the wholesalers who in turn send the goods across the country on the roads. One of the biggest industries here in this time period as far as transportation is gonna be your stagecoach lines. We have stagecoaches to carry people across the country and you're gonna have big trucking companies. These big trucking companies are gonna be used here guys to transport goods from place to place. You know, I told you about, about, about Lewis and Clark going across the country. William, William Clark carried, carried his personal slave with him on this trip. His name was York. William Clark got York when he was a little boy. He was like three years old when Mr. York became the property of Mr. Clark. Well, after the big trip across the country, York wanted his freedom. And William Clark wouldn't give it to him. Finally, in 1812, Clark finally freed York, and York moved to Kentucky and started a trucking company. He got 10 or 15 large truck wagons and started hauling freight, furniture, the whole nine yards across the country on wagons. These truck wagons are just like transfer trucks are today. They carried goods from place to place. They carried it from the factories to the wholesalers and the wholesalers to the consumers, okay, to the, to the marketplaces across the countryside. The, the roads were very important. The same time period in the 1820s, American investors go to England to investigate the railroads. And the railroads come to America in the 1830s. And we start building railroads starting in Baltimore, Maryland. By, 1870, by 1860, the American North has got close to 20,000 miles of railroad. And they go from large city to large city. These railroads can travel at 40 miles an hour on the average. That's the average speed is 40 miles an hour. Some could go 60, some could go 45 and so forth, okay? The American South only built like 8,000 miles of railroad and they didn't go from large city to large city. They went from large city to the countryside where the railroads could pick up cotton, okay? So the South didn't build large railroads and the North did. And the North will take very much advantage of these railroads in the American Civil War. The South should build railroads from day one and they did not do it the way they should have done. So you see what's going on here, guys. We're building railroads, we're building roads, canals. Here in the American South, we discovered our rivers. 
I want you guys to go to Google Earth, Google Earth and go to Maps, but just type in Alabama and go to Maps and then pull it out so you see the whole southeast. Look at all the rivers. You got the Ohio, the Tennessee, the Cumberland. You have the Missouri, the Arkansas, the Illinois, the Red River, the Yazoo River, Mississippi River system down to New Orleans. And then you have the Pearl River goes up to Jackson, up above Philadelphia, Mississippi. Then you have the Mobile Bay. The Mobile River goes right up into the Tom Beef. It goes up toward Columbus, Mississippi, up there toward Tuscaloosa, which today has got a canal that connects it with the Tennessee River, the Tennessee Tom Waterway. Then you have the Alabama River, which goes into the Coosa and the Tallapoosa River above Montgomery. Then you have the Chattachi River. Then you have the Apalachicola River, which turns into the Chattahoochee that goes up to Atlanta. You have the St. John's River. You have the Suwannee River. You have the St. Mary's River into South Georgia. You have the Savannah River. You have the Broad River in, North, in South Carolina. You have lots of rivers, the, the, uh, the James, the James River, up in up in up in the areas around around Richmond, Virginia. You have the Cape Fear River in North Carolina, and the Neuse River. And all these rivers can handle various sizes of steamboats. When Robert Fulton invented steamboats here in the early 1810 time period, steamboating becomes very popular. And by 1820 and 1830, you've got various sizes of steamboats. You have the big 100 passenger steamboats that go up and down the big rivers. You have the little steamboats that carry 15 people on the small narrow rivers. And all these rivers are very much gonna be made for Southern industry, for Southern travel, mainly for the cotton to go down the rivers. That's the main purpose of all these rivers. Well, a lot of these rivers were full of deadheads and full of logs and full of stumps and could not be navigated because of all the debris in the river. And here comes a guy named Henry Streve. Henry Streve is going to build a boat with a, with a horseshoe shape on the, on the front end of it. This horseshoe shape will be covered in iron. We're heading toward an all steel Navy, starting with Henry Streve. And his first, his first boat is made to go up the rivers with a horseshoe bow. And he'd go up the rivers and he'd knock out these stumps. Next to his big boat would be a barge. And they had a winch above the horseshoe. They put a diver in the water and he hooked the log up or hooked, hooked the stump up to that winch and they pulled it out of the water and put it on that barge. When the barge got filled, they pulled the barge out of the river down to a sawmill and brought a brand new barge in. They kept on working. For 20 years, they cleaned out the rivers across the South. The boat he had was called a hippopotamus. And Henry Shreve is a man who went down the Mississippi River system. They had a bay old diver that walked the whole river from St. Louis to New Orleans over a number of months to clean that river out. Could y'all imagine having that job? And then they clean out the Red River, the Arkansas River, and so forth. When they went, to, when they went up the Red River, they formed a new little town up here, a new little village up here, and they named it for Henry Shreve. The little town is called Shreveport, Louisiana. It's named for Henry Shreve. And so the South has great rivers, and so they decided they didn't need railroads. I want to tell you, they had a railroad from New Orleans to Memphis and one from New Orleans to Nashville and one from New Orleans to Atlanta and one from New Orleans to Jacksonville, Florida. And then from Jacksonville, Florida, going to Memphis and New Orleans and Nashville, Tennessee and so forth. And going up the East Coast to Raleigh and to Richmond. They built railroads out of Atlanta going up into the Carolinas and Richmond. The South had a powerhouse in this war. But they did not do it. They used their rivers instead of building railroads. So part of the American system, guys, is going to be turnpikes and highways. It's going to be canals. It's going to be modern cities with, mod with modern streets and modern sewage systems and, mo and modern water systems. Okay. It's going to have 
have a new development of a housing in these towns. You'll start seeing uh, out, out districts outside of town where people live. If you live down in New York City, down there, down there in the in the Wall Street area or down in the Battery area, you don't want to live down there. You'd rather live in the Tenderloin. You'd rather live in in Queens or live up in toward, up toward Harlem. And so New York built the streetcar system to get you down there based on the railroad system. And they started off pulling horses, using horses to pull the streetcars. And then, of course, it went steam power from time to time. All right, it went on from there. City of New Orleans, same things. Streetcars across town. Mobile had streetcars. Pensacola had streetcars. I was a little boy. These towns still had the streetcars going. I remember the streetcars as a little boy from Pensacola to go shopping. And I want to ride on the streetcar. We ain't going that direction. You better stay right here with us. So you start seeing modern transportation across America. It starts changing in this market revolution. Okay? You're going to start seeing new ways to finance business. In 1816, United States Congress is going to reappropriate the monies for a second national bank. The first national bank had lost its charter after 20 years. So by, by, by 1810, their charter had ended. The war came along with England. It held the bank up. And in 1816, we chartered the national banking system. And this bank is going to be financed at $30 million. You want to start a railroad company? You go to the National Bank. You can go through and start a new textile mill? You go to the National Bank. You go through and buy a new steamboat? Start a new steamboat company? You go to the National Bank. That's your center of financing during this time period. The state banks were also reestablished under the National Banking System, and America had pretty good money supply to build new industries to build upon. The South didn't really take it up as much as the North did, okay? 1816, a 20-year charter. The charter of the bank will end in 1836 when Andrew Jackson is president. That's when the National Bank is going to end, okay? So guys, the American system is very important here for this time period, all right? And a lot of folks says this market revolution is not constitutional. The Constitution does not discuss the American government getting involved in laissez-faire economics. That individuals should be the ones who put their money into industries, not the federal government. A lot of folks did not want to see the new national bank be reestablished. They said it was not constitutional to begin, in, begin with, and now we have made it three times bigger than what it was. And a lot of folks says the National Bank is nothing but a three-head monster. You gotta be careful that national banking system. And one of your biggest critics will be Andrew Jackson during this time period. In 1816, we put we put protect, protective tariffs, protective tariffs on American on, on foreign imports. In 1816, we put special tariffs on international imports. The problem is England. During the Napoleonic Wars, England kept manufacturing. They built big warehouses to house all these finished goods in during the war. When the war comes to an end, England is going to open up all these warehouses and flood the market, the worldwide market, with cheap goods. Reminds me of a Walmart store coming to a small town. When I lived in Crestview in the 1960s, we had over 85 businesses on downtown Crestview. These 85 businesses were owned by individual shop owners. These men and these women, these families who owned all these different shops in downtown Crestview employed their neighbors and their church friends to work for them. And they gave them health insurance. They took care of these people here in this time period. 85 different stores in downtown Chris. We had two dollar stores. We had like four drug stores. We had a, we had three or four bakeries. We had a we had a men's clothing store. We had several ladies' clothing store. We had the Buster Brown shoe shop, the Red Goose shoe shop. We had Crisco's five and dime stock shop, which y'all now call the dollar store. We had a theater. And on Saturday afternoons, as your moms and dads went shopping across town and buying the buying the groceries and so forth for the next week, the kids went to the theater. We paid a quarter and watched movies for about four hours. It was called Kids Day on Saturday afternoons. 
Cokes would cost us 10 cents. A bag of popcorn would cost you 15 cents. A snicker bar would cost you a nickel. You guys will never see that again. We went to the movies, guys, for less than a dollar. That's all in for less than a dollar. Today, it cost you $30, just what we got for a dollar in this time period. It's just part of it. Crestview was a booming place. We had, we, had, we had all kinds of, we had the Great Day department store. We had the IGA and the Piggly Wiggly and all this stuff. Crestview was booming. The train came into town four to, uh, eight times a day with passenger service. That's just passenger service eight times a day, four in each direction. We had lots of freight trains come through Crestview. We had a shirt company called the Apex Shirt Company in downtown Crestview. That's where Florida A&M have their pharmacy school today. It's down there where City Hall is. Crestview was a booming place during this time period. And then here in the early 1990s comes Walmart. And look what happened downtown Crestview. They started closing up shops, people went out of business. Where Crestview had 85, had 85 businesses, Walmart has 40 departments. And all the department heads are part-timers with no insurance. Okay? That's what England did to us. And because England for the flood fled the market with all these cheap goods, we go into a depression. It's called the Panic of 1819. The Panic of 1819. We go into a depression. It does, does not last very long, but England did it. And you start seeing signs of a worldwide marketplace because of it. Okay? So in the era of good feelings, there was a depression that took place. Okay? You all know that President, President Monroe ran for re-election in 1820. And nobody went against him. He's the only man who ran. The Federalist Party had faded away. The Republican Party had much, pretty much faded away. We had no political parties during this time period. The people of America got along with each other to a certain extent. Different place here. Okay, so the era of good feelings, political politics was not a very prevalent thing here in America during this time period. It won't get high power again until 1825 in the election that took place that year. So guys, you're going to start seeing major change take place under the era of good feelings and the market revolution that takes place here. You also are going to see the rise of industry. Before we had major industrial plants, we had private industrial plants. This was called the putting out system. One gentleman, let's say he does shoes, he owns a shoe business. One gentleman would go down to the docks, say in Boston, or go to one, one, of, the, one of the trading houses in Boston, and he'd get a wagon load of leather, various grades of leather, various thicknesses of leather, and so forth. He got pigskin, he got calf, he got cowhide, he got horse hide, he got the leather together. He had 10 families around his neighborhood who made shoes for him. And he'd go to their houses and give them part of the leather supply that he just picked up from the wholesaler. And he'd tell one household, I want size eight shoes. Tell the next household, I want size nine shoes. Tell the next house household, I want children's shoes of various sizes. Tell the next household, I want women's shoes of various sizes. And these families were the ones who made the shoes. The fathers and the older boys were the ones who got the heels and the soles of the shoes put together. They were your cobblers. The wives and the girls would go through and use that calf skin and that, and that sheep skin or whatever they're using and cut out the uppers for the shoes. Cut it out with the tongues in the shoe, too. So the tongue and all the uppers were together in one thing. And then one of the kids would punch holes in the shoes for the shoelaces. And the little kids would be the ones who put in the shoelaces. The men folks would sew the uppers to the soles of the shoes. And they might make maybe, say, four pairs of shoes a day. The old, the old shoe owner, the, old, the owner of the shoe company would come back around 30 days later and would pick up a hundred pair of shoes. Came to his shop and sell them. Pay the people who work for him in piecemeal. 
You got so much per shoe. You get 25 cents a shoe or 50 cents a shoe. And he's trying to sell them for four or five dollars a shoe. Then he started thinking, what if I go and build a building and made them come to my building to make those shoes so I could watch over them? I think those folks can make, can make six pairs of shoes a day instead of four if they had somebody to watch over them and really kind of push them to do so. So the old manufacturer goes out and he finds 30 acres of land and he buys it. And he goes and he builds a 10,000 square foot building that has windows on the east side and windows on the west side. So your workers will have daylight from sun up to sundown. And they worked them from sun up to sundown. These people work 12 to 14 hours a day. And in these buildings, he built work tables, he, worked, he built work benches. He bought the big equipment that they might need, but told them to bring their own tools for individual detailing, individual work. He said, if I go through and buy tools for them, they're going to steal them. So make them bring their own tools to work. He got them in there. They started working in these large factories. They're commuting from home to the workplace. It might be in an hour walk or an hour carriage ride from the house to the workplace. Then he started thinking, I need to do two more things to improve the situation. I need to go through and hire me an overseer to oversee these workers. But overseers was are used on plantations that has a negative term to it. So I'm gonna call them supervisors. I'm gonna hire me four or five men who are pretty tough and four or five women who are pretty tough. I won't take any back talk and I'll make them my supervisors and they'll watch over the labor of these people. And then I'm gonna turn around and build me a company town. I'm gonna to build row houses and put these families in the row houses. I'm gonna build a company store in which they buy all their food and all their supplies, all their clothing through the company store. I'll hire me several accountants and a manager of that company store, and we'll have a credit going on here for everything they buy there'll be a 30% interest put on these items. I'll make money off my own workers. I'll go through and charge them rent to live in those houses. And I'll tell them what color they can paint their houses and what they can do to their houses, and they have no say so. And they can't grow no garden because I want them buying food from the company store. And then he brings in the company church and the company school. The company school taught the kids how to become good workers the church told you that the meek shall inherit the earth. If you work hard for your corporation, for your company, you will go to heaven. Nothing to do with salvation is you go to heaven for hard work. What a mess. All these people get involved now in a situation that is called the company town. And they're just like slaves. Charles Sumner, the great senator from Massachusetts in 1850 said, America's got two evil masters. We have the Lords of the Looms, those industrial people, their industrial plants in their company towns. And we have the, the, the Lords of the Lash who own plantations. And both Lords are miserable. Both Lords are terrible. We gotta stop this mess. Thomas Jefferson told us we must never industrialize. In the same breath, he said, we need to kill slavery and get rid of it. And here comes a new way of slavery that involves the industrial plants, just like Mr. Jefferson warned us. You do not need them. We have no need for them. So here comes all this change taking place in this time period, okay? So industrialization is going to appear here, mainly in the North in this time period. The South is not industrialized to, to a certain extent, but then but the South did, okay? Now, another interesting thing that takes place here in this time period, in 1819, the United States is going to, is going to outlaw slavery in the Northern states. Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts are going to outlaw slavery. 
They outlawed slavery and did nothing else. These former slaves did not have civil liberties. They passed what is called the Black Codes. The Black Codes were legal codes that kept the, the African Americans in what they would call in that time period in their place. Did not give them a chance for advancement, a chance to vote, a chance to the court system, a chance to politics. They totally did not give the former slaves in the North any kind of civil liberties. Remember, guys, the Northern slaves only amounted to about 5% of slaves total. So 5% of the slaves were in the North. These slaves were also given their freedom papers. Freedom papers are issued by a judge. If you're a Southerner and wants to go through and free your slaves, you got to go for the court system. And the judge, both North and South, is the one who issues the freedom papers to the people who have been enslaved. It has to be done legally by a judge. It's going to cost money to do this. And up North, they carried those former slaves to the court system and they got their freedom papers. Those freedom papers look like passports. You cannot lose your freedom papers. You must carry them with you wherever you go because there's slave catchers out there who make a living capturing black folks, being free or slave, and put them back into slavery. So a lot of your free slaves have to be very careful. Solomon Northrup, y'all might have seen a movie called 12 Years as a Slave, the story of Solomon Northrup. He got waylaid by a bunch of slave catchers here in the 1830s, they stole his papers, they burned his freedom papers and hauled him off to Louisiana and sold him into slavery. It took, his, it took him 12 years to finally get Mr. Solomon Northrup freed from this time period. Okay? So the North frees the slaves and nothing else. They free the slaves and nothing else. This is all in 1819. Okay, so 1819 is a pretty important year. You have that Land Act. You'll have that Depression take place. You'll have people freed in the North from slavery. So 1819 is a lot like 1619 when it comes to events in one year in this time period. Okay, so guys, here comes the industrial system out of all. Well, there's two other things that are important here in this time period that I want to discuss as we get toward the end of all of this. And that's going to be two items that takes place in Congress during this time period. In 1820, people have flooded into an old Northwest, Northwest Territory area that's called Missouri. Missouri is part of the original Northwest Territory. Remember that Thomas Jefferson and his group here in the late 1880s outlawed slavery in the Northern Territories. Slavery cannot go into the Northern, the Northwestern Territories. And here, Missouri, on the Southern end of the Northwest Territories, applies for statehood. They got 35,000 people who live here. Now, these folks have come from Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and moved into Missouri. The ones in the southern part of these three states have been slave owners. Also coming in are people from Kentucky, Tennessee, the Carolinas, Virginia, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas into Missouri. And they bring their slaves with them. So Missouri proposes to enter the Union here in 1820 as a slave state. And a war breaks out in Congress. The Northern senators and House members says there'll be no more slave states because it's outlawed in this territory. Slavery we're doing away with slowly but surely. The South demanded that their people be allowed to carry their property. And using the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, allow them to have their slaves in this territory. Well, guys, if Missouri enters as a slave state, there is no free state to enter during this time period. 
there's a little territory just north of Massachusetts that's called Maine. Maine has got like 40,000 people who live here. It's got half the number it needs for statehood. But it looks like we're going to go to war here over Missouri. For the first time, the South will see how much the North hates slavery. Now's the time to end it. Before cotton culture gets so big. We got close to a million slaves in the South in 1820. It's gonna be close to 4 million in 1860. We should have killed it right here and then, right here and now, killed slavery in 1820 and been done away with it. We've been in line with Spain and with, and with Mexico and with, and with England by doing so. These other countries are seeing no need for slavery anymore in the world. How are these people as wage laborers? Free them. Let them have their own little homesteads. They have the land. They have the land act. Let them buy their own little homesteads. Become middle class and work in these factory systems, or they want to work on the farms. It's up to them. War almost breaks out here, guys. And here comes Senator Henry Clay of Kentucky. And Henry Clay said, "I got a plan to solve the problem. What we'll do is we'll let Maine enter as a state prematurely." And that'll be our free state. So I'll give you two senators from Maine. Then we'll go to Missouri and allow them to enter as a slave state, and there'll be two slave senators to join the Senate. And that'll keep the balance in the Senate between free and slave. And then we'll draw a line across the country. And this line is going to go all the way to Spanish America and the middle part of the Great Plains. The western border. The western border of the United States with Spain is out here along the Rocky Mountains. It is called the transcontinental border. The transcontinental border was marked off by John Quincy Adams as Secretary of State. It's part of the Florida Adams Onus Treaty. Okay? And we're going to draw a line across the country using the border of southern Missouri as the border across to the Spanish territories, across the Louisiana Purchase. That line is called 3630. Anything above 3630 will be for industrialization and for free folks. Anything below this line is for slavery and agriculture. At the same time comes a group who calls themselves the Young Americans. And these young Americans want to see the United States take over all the Caribbean, all of Mesoamerica, and all of South America. And their plan is to draw a line at 3630 across the country. The northern part will be for industrialization. And then they'll go down to Brazil and draw another border and between that Brazilian border and 3630 will be for slaves, for agricultural slave use. And then below that line in South America, it'll be used for industrialization. So America, United States will, help, will control the whole Western hemisphere with the Northern part and the Southern parts being used for industrialization. The middle part of the country will be used for agriculture and for raw materials. Now, how crazy is this going to be? Okay, these are called the young Americans in this time period. All right. Speaking of slavery, the president has a solution too for slavery. President James Monroe believes that we should send all the people of African descent back to Africa. He says, let's just get rid of them. Let's take all these people, both free and slave, and transport them back to Africa. Okay, this is just totally crazy here. This is James Monroe's president. We realize if we take over a million people and transport them back to Africa, of which they do not really belong to anymore, they're now Americans, they live in American society, and to send them back, we lose half of them being transported back to Africa. And once they get there, they'll have trouble with, with food supply and with diseases. So this African colonialization society did not quite work out. And it was formed in, and it was formed in 1818 by your president in this time period. We realize that it will not work, this 
this African colonialization society. They did go, however, and send several thousand people back to Africa to a place in Liberia, which is, in the, which is down on the curve of Africa on the Atlantic Ocean. In Liberia, they sent a bunch back down here and they couldn't make it. They wrote letters home, y'all get us out of here. We are Americans, we're not Africans. We cannot survive here. They did build a town here. It's the only city that is named for an American president in the world. It's the only city in, in, in non-American territory that's named for an American president. And the place is called Monrovia. Monrovia, Liberia. It's named for President Monroe. Monroeville, Alabama up here is named for President Monroe. It was founded here in the time they built Claiborne and President Monroe. The first big county in Alabama was called Monroe County. They didn't come to almost the whole southern part of Alabama in the early years, okay? So guys, we realize that slavery has got to be dealt with in a positive manner. And with Henry Clay's compromise, slavery is not even touched. All they did was kick the can down the road. And it's crazy here. Henry Clay is called the great compromiser from this time period. If anybody's got a problem, Henry Clay can solve. In 1824, he runs for the presidency. In 1832, he runs for the presidency. In 1844, he run, 1843, he runs for the presidency. He runs until he's an old, old man. Henry Clay and John, Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams and, and uh, John C. Calhoun and Daniel Webster are all major political players in this time period. And these, th these four men all die in the early 1850s. And these men are the ones who really kind of push us into American Civil War. Reminds me today of Mr. O'Connell, Mr. 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 Uh, O'Connell and Mr. Mr. Lindsey Graham and all this bunch in Congress. We still have that same little group who tries to run it all here, okay? It's interesting to look at these people, all right? So guys, we're going to have this question with Missouri, and of course, they did not solve the problem. They made a compromise, which means the problem continues on. When Spain leaves the hemisphere in the early 1820s, we realize that America could face many problems. So therefore, we're going to make a policy, a foreign policy, about Latin and South America. The man who makes this major issue his own is going to be John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State. John Quincy Adams says, I got a way to solve the problem with Latin America and South America. When Spain leaves, nobody else comes in here. We're going to block off Mesoamerica, the Caribbean, and South America to foreign influences. We'll make sure that no other country comes in here to colonialize our hemisphere. Mr. Mr. John Quincy Adams made this decision and wrote the, wrote the document here in the fall of 1823. In the fall of 1823. So I got the right date on that. Let's write the right date here on this one. Long here, I think it's 1823. Well, my notes are out of order here. Yeah. It's either 1822 or 1823. I think it's 1823. Mr. Adams is going to write this, what is called the Monroe Doctrine. Mr. Adams, and Mr. Adams wrote the foreign policy, but President Monroe gave it, presented it to Congress. That's why it's called Monroe Doctrine. The president gets credit for the work of another man. He said it all the time now in, in American politics. The Monroe Doctrine is going to say that no European powers can come into our hemisphere and colonialize it. Well, our Navy does not have more than 40 ships. It's too small to enforce this. So John Quincy Adams says, we're going to go to England. We're going to let England become our partner in the Monroe Doctrine. And let the British Navy patrol this area to keep foreign influences out of here. Okay. In return, England gets free trade 
across the hemisphere. That could cause a war right there on itself. So our big partner in the Monroe Doctrine is going to be England, Great Britain. They'll send their Navy in here to help us patrol this area and make sure that foreign influences stay out of our, out of our hemisphere. The Monroe Doctrine becomes American foreign policy. We are still following the Monroe Doctrine in today's world. Now here is the offset of all of this. With the Monroe Doctrine in place, the European powers will go elsewhere to colonialize the world. The Germans are going to go to the Middle East. They colonialized the areas of Iraq and Iran. By the late 1860s, they got a railroad that runs from Baghdad to Berlin. Okay? The, the, well, the major part of the Middle East is being controlled by the Germans. The area of Palestine is being controlled by the British. The British and Dutch are trying to control South Africa. There'll be a big war breakout down here in the late 1890s called the Boer War, in which the British and the, the British and the Dutch go to war against each other. France is going to take Algiers. And they're going to take the area around Casablanca, Morocco. They're going to take a lot of a lot of North Africa, including Egypt. In 1869, the French will open up in Egypt what is called the Suez Canal, the shortcut between the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. The French owns all this. The Belgians are controlling the areas of Central Africa that involves the Congo. It's called the Belgium Congo during this time period. Okay. England will also go into India and they bring apartheid to India because they look down upon the darker complected people of India. The white man's burden, white supremacy comes to India. The French are going into the areas of Siam. Today that is going to be Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand. And then over in China, they all get involved in it. The Germans, the French, the British, the Dutch, and the Japanese start colonializing India. In 1898, China gets tired of it. They call on us to come over to be the peacemaker. It's called the Boxer Rebellion. And we go through and tell those white Europeans, y'all behave yourselves over here, don't cause any trouble. And the same breath we turn around and tell Japan to get out, that you cannot be here. That's strike one toward Pearl Harbor. You have got to go through and create your enemies. We ran Japan off. A few years later, Japan invades what is now Korea. This time, the Russians get after them. We have what is called the Russo-Japanese War. President Theodore Roosevelt brings both sides to New Hampshire for a peace treaty. The Russians get more out of it than the Japanese get out of it. That's strike two. You've got to create your enemies. During World War I, Japan was part of the Allies fighting against Germany. Japanese Navy was, was a big protector, the big patroller of the Mediterranean Sea during World War I. They were an ally to the United States and to, and to Great Britain. But at the, Paris, at the Paris Peace Treaty, we mistreated them. We talked bad to them. That's strike three. During the 1930s, we're, set, we're selling all of our extra oil and our extra sheet metal to Japan. In 1941, we cut them off. No more fuel oil, no more, no more sheet metal, no more materials, no more raw materials that are metal, that are metal uh, components, scrap metal, if you will. That's in the summer of 1941. What happened in December of 41? Japan retaliated by hitting Pearl Harbor, on American territory. So guys, the Monroe Doctrine is gonna be in charge of foreign affairs, but in the future, it's gonna be some major issues for us to deal with, okay? So don't forget about the Monroe Doctrine, don't forget about the, the uh, 
the compromise of 1820, the Missouri Compromise of 1820. They're very important during this time period. Okay. So, guys, we got some interesting things happening here uh, in America in this area of good feelings. It's the area of good feelings, but some places you don't feel so good about. You go up under the surface a little bit, you start finding all kinds of little issues dangling below the surface, ready to come forward. Okay. All right, that's going to conclude this lecture that deals with all of this. And we're going to now turn to another lecture in a, in a little bit that's going to deal with Andrew Jackson and the Jacksonian period in American history. Okay, all right.